Thank you ever so much for joining us today in this panel session, panel 41, COVID-19 business and international development. What is the role of business in responding to, to the pandemic in the global south? And um, when we were putting this call together, obviously we were quite, quite conscious of the backdrop of reduced kind of funding for overseas development aid and sort of a global austerity in that sphere, as well as hearing about some of the global transnationals who are accruing extreme profits during the pandemic, whilst also recognising that SMEs risk sort of disappearing in, in some contexts and people are struggling, people who otherwise would be surviving sort of through subsistence entrepreneurship face incredible challenges just to sort of survive on a daily basis in lockdowns in in various contexts and so yeah so we we hope that these presentations today will really help us think and have this quality time thinking a little bit more about sort of the role of business and what business role should be in responding to to the pandemic in the global south so today's session has sort of three parts to it the first part is our three core presentations, and each of those will have 15 minutes to present, followed by sort of um, five minutes for questions, and we'll take each presentation in turn with questions at the end. And then we'll move to part two, which is sort of two additional presentations that both have 10 minutes each because they were submitted by sort of conveners of this business and development group. So we thought it was fair to sort of structure the time to, to give sort of um, the pre presenters who were outside of sort of our leadership of this study group to have, to have sort of a, a richer time frame and more opportunity for bespoke questions really. So we'll have those two presentations. Um, Jesse will chair that part. And then at the end, Jesse will also spend uh, a little bit of time at the end just talking about the business and development study group in the DSA and field a general discussion as we draw this session to a close. So before we make a start on our presentations, just to let you know as well that um, we are looking for sort of a new convener or possibly conveners for the business and development study group when Jess is going to talk about that at the end. But if that is something that you're interested in, then please do email either Jesse or myself, particularly if you if you know you're not going to be here at the end of the session when Jesse talks about that. And then finally, if you've got questions for our panelists, please feel free to either sort of raise your hand when we field the discussion part at the end of each presentation, or also feel free to post your question or comment in the chat. And whether that's in Zoom chat or in Hoover, um, um, they'll both be fielded and we'll be able to see both of those. So thank you very much for that little bit of sort of introduction there at the beginning. And our first presenters today are Jeff and Jeffrey and um, Maureen. And their presentation is entitled African Local Industrial Health Linkages evidence from a cancer study in a COVID-19 world. And just in terms of timekeeping, I'll be quite strict on time, just to be fair to everybody. So 15 minutes to present and then five minutes at the end, and I'll give you sort of about a three minute warning sort of towards the end of your presentation time. So Jess, Jeff, over to you. Thank you very much. And hopefully you're, you'll be okay with your slides and Maureen I know Maureen is your co-author as well and she's with you so you might want to unmute Jeff and over to you thank you very much I will switch off my video so that I, I don't have any bandwidth challenges and I'll share the video Let's share the screen sorry All right, I presume everybody can see the screen now? Yes, we can yes. see. Yes, great. So th thank you, Joanne, for, 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 for the introduction. And uh, as she said, this is a co-presentation with Maureen. And so Maureen, please feel free to jump in at any time. So this, 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 this presentation that we are 
what we're giving today is, 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 is based on, on a project called ICA, ICCA, which stands for Innovation for Cancer Care in Africa. Uh, it is a collaborative research project funded by the SRC and it involves uh, Kenya, Tanzania, the UK and India. And most of the stuff that we're going to uh, discuss today or present to the group uh, is based on that work uh, or the work stream that I'm involved in. That's looking at what are the dynamics that are involved for, for local production of cancer project, uh, products on the, on the African continent. But it also draws from a webinar that we held in October uh, 2020, uh, which, is, which is the one on the right, uh, which looked at the local manufacturing for health in Africa in the time of COVID, and looking at the experiences and uh, lessons for policy. Uh, we also further went on to produce a recording tray in the BMJ Global Health, that looks at some of the things that are fascinating that should be um, focused on. If you're interested in that, you can always uh, uh, use the links at the bottom. So one of the things that has always been fascinating, and Maureen has been in this field much longer than I was, when I joined around about 2010, we always used to, in conferences like this, be asked, does Africa manufacture, or can Africa manufacture pharmaceuticals? And so this, this, this uh, presentation, uh, my apologies, is very, the, 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 the text is pretty small, it was, it was a way of demonstrating that local manufacture of pharmaceuticals in Africa, on the African continent has been going on for decades. And in that particular work, we showed that it started at least in the 1930s, that's for small molecules. But if you go to Egypt, Egypt started as far back as 1881 to produce biologics. So there has been activity that has been going on on the, on the, on the continent. And part of the work that we did with this, demonstrating that this is what's going on in Africa is actually, uh, if you're interested, uh, presented in this book, Making Medicines in Africa. It's an open access, free, free to access book that is there. And some of the things that we grappled with was, what, what are the, why if, if Africa has been producing medicine since the 1930s, why hasn't there been an acceleration of technological capabilities, upgrading of the complexities of the uh, drugs that are produced on the continent? And uh, so some of the things that we grappled with have to do with business models. Is it an issue of policy? Is it global value chains and the hegemony that's in place? Is it procurement strategies? And, and any, any, anything else that, that affects the sector? So if you looked at the previous slide, we, we saw that local manufacture has been going on at least since the 2000s. A lot of activity started occurring around about the early 2000s. So you notice that around about 2007, the African Union actually came up with the African health strategy. Around about the same time, they also produced the business plan for the pharmaceutical manufacturing plan for Africa. And if you proceed, you actually realize that five years later, the East African region also produced its own pharmaceutical manufacturing plan of action. And so did uh, countries, countries like, like, um, like Ethiopia. Um, the, the thing that we found fascinating or that I find fascinating about this is when you look at a lot of countries, action occurs at national level. But if you look at the African Union, for example, it tends to produce or tries to solve things at a supranational level and then cascade them to the, to the countries. And you can actually see this in terms of the roadmaps and the strategies uh, that, 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 were being, that were being set. Now, suffice to say, um, Around about 2020, our project actually started around about 2018 and around about 2020, that's when COVID hit. And what I'm going to present actually draws from the experience of COVID and also draws from the interviews that we've done for, for Cancer Care. And uh, I still remember around about 2012 at a conference in, in, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And when we were asking why hasn't there been this traction to produce pharmaceuticals for the continent? A delegate at that conference says Africa needs a disaster to wake up. And that disaster eventually occurred in 20, 2020. And it shook the politicians, it shook a lot of people. And the traction that had not been there prior to that has actually come, uh, come on. So now coming to, 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 to the focus of, 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 of uh, this presentation, cancer is one of the diseases that, are, that is wreaking havoc on the continent and people are not focusing on it. 
And I remember in some, some um, interviews way back in 2018 in South Africa, someone says Africa has a disaster that's waiting to happen. And the issue is the focus has been so much on infectious diseases there has, that people have uh, let, not, uh, not focused so much on non-communicable diseases. And people talk of the demographic dividend to say Africa is the youngest population, but that young population is aging. And as that young population is aging, non-communicable diseases will take off. And one of the challenges that has been seen and our, 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 our research project has actually shown it in, in Kenya and Tanzania is cancer is killing a lot of people. And what we were interested in was where are these drugs or molecules that are being used for oncology treatment coming from? Where, where are they coming from? And so we were then interested in understanding what, is it, what does it take for these things or these oncology products to be produced on the, on the African continent? Now, when you look at cancer, you basically have uh, different ways or treatment uh, types that you, that you can use. So you can use surgery or you can use hormone therapy or immunotherapy or stem cell therapy. And this belongs to a class of products called biologics because they are manufacturing in the UK taking advantage of the life processes. But you also have radiation therapy and chemotherapy and we classify these as small molecules. And if you have a science background, obviously if you look at the size of the structures, the, the, the chemical drug is much, much smaller than if you look at a cell therapy, for example. So, Initially, when we, when, we, when we wanted to do this, we had actually thought, okay, what do, why, why don't we look at this? But from the interviews, what actually emerged was actually fascinating. They were saying, yeah, we can talk about producing small molecules, you know, your, your, your drugs. But some of the newer technologies are actually in biologics. And a particular class of those biologics are the monoclonal antibodies. Now, I won't go into the technicalities because we don't have the time. So, I, I, they, in, in, in the interviews and the discourse with the colleagues, they often say these, these, these are better drugs. They, they have less side effects than uh, chemotherapy or, radiother uh, or radiotherapy. And as you can see, they say there is an opportunity, if you look at the very last column here, there is an opportunity in terms of expiry of these uh, monoclonal antibodies. So as they expire, people can then come in and, and produce biosimilars, which are well, not exactly copies, but um, more of um, a molecule that's highly similar to an innovator drug that, that, that is already on the market. So, the, so what was pointed out was this issue that this is what the African countries can get, get into. And it's not something that is new per se, because if you go to Morocco, there is a company called Sodema. They've actually gone into a joint venture with Biocard in Russia, and they are producing this two uh, monoclonal antibodies that are put in brain. So bevacizumab is used for brain tumor, kidney tumor, and vector and advanced uh, cervical cancer. Bevacizumab is for non-Hodgins uh, lymphoma. So now drawing from the work on, 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 on COVID and our industry, industry work, we realized that when COVID hit, uh, supplies stopped and uh, global value chains literally ground to a halt, the countries then tend uh, inwards to look at their local pharmaceutical manufacturing uh, concerns and say, can we do this? And a lot of them were in LH. The ones that could do something had invested in broad uh, capabilities. And where these broad capabilities that we're talking about are innovation capabilities, technological capabilities, manufacturing and manufacturing capabilities. So they could easily repurpose those to actually uh, help with, with, um, with, with COVID. And they only didn't have broad, they didn't only have broad capabilities, but they also had linkages and collaborations within, uh, within the country or even outside the country. And one thing that's important to understand is these broad capabilities and these linkages are built on infrastructures for innovation, production and technological capabilities. And it is not a short-term game. Those countries that were able to get off their feet pretty fast had actually invested in sustainable development of of of, uh, of these of these um, pillars, so to speak, of um, of local production. And one of the things that came out in our in our in, in, in that webinar was that the local 
public health system can be used as active industry policy to actually pull products onto the market and support the SMEs that Joanna was talking about, uh, about earlier. So the local public health system is actually one of the pillars that can be used to support this. But we acknowledge that there is a, a limitation in terms of the skills and everything else. So there obviously needs to be centers of excellence that can be used to actually bring these, um, these things to, 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 to fruition. So if, you've not, if you've looked at the press recently, there has been a, uh, an announcement that BioVac in South Africa is going to be in a consortium with others, is going to be used as one of those technology transfer hubs for the uh, pro local production of um, mRNA vaccine, um, mRNA COVID vaccine. Now, this is in essence a center of excellence, but it is a center of excellence because that country, South Africa, has had sustained investments in institution, institutional architecture, and building cumulative institutional memories. That is the reason why BioVac has been able to do that. Now, I'm cognizant that I've got three minutes left and I won't overshoot my time. So one of the things that came up surprisingly in the interviews is if you want to produce monoclonal antibodies locally, who should do it? And the, what we found in our interviews is actually the local vaccine manufacturing companies are best placed to produce monoclonal antibodies. And uh, if you are interested in innovation, you realize that monoclonal antibodies, if just caused on vaccine manufacture, are basically an incremental innovation. And the reason why you would opt for an incremental innovation is you don't disrupt too much the production processes. The skills required are similar. Your production infrastructure is likely to be the same and you don't disrupt the business models and the impact on regulation is also likely to be incremental. So that's one of the things. So if you look at the upstream, upstream and downstream activities that are occurring here, they are likely to be less or not that not they're likely they're, they're pretty much similar in the vaccine manufacturing industry and in the monoclonal. And this is when you whether you're dealing with a bacterial, viral, or cell cell culture uh, approach. And so one of the things that we found fascinating in one of the companies that we interviewed is we realized actually that they have been very good at in-house technology transfer, but they've also worked with uh, external companies, multinational companies to actually out-license uh, technologies that have been developed in Africa. So this is, this is uh, um, I may not have said this earlier, but this is actually work in progress in terms of our analysis. So we're saying, this is actually possible because here is an entity in Africa that has exhibited everything that I said in the previous slide and things seem to be working well. So in conclusion, uh, what is it that we have found in terms of ICA and COVID-19? We've realized that in East and Southern Africa, there is no local manufacture of oncology products, except for example, in South Africa. And lo local production of the biologics is there in North Africa, in Morocco. But the issue of high safety standards and specialist handling for oncology or infection is a key consideration if uh, this, this needs to occur on the, on the ground. And this brings in the issue of business models and business ownership. Will a family owned company be able to grow big enough to solve the challenges that we have? And we're not so sure about that. And so reiterating the issues that I spoke about uh, COVID, we realized that when local innovation and manufacturing scale up was facilitated, it was because government used adaptable procurement and that broad based uh, industrial structure that was there to be able to uh, be adept and agile to deal with issues. But there are still constraints in terms of local testing and accreditation and regulation. But the interesting thing is we have realized recently that there is action that's occurring in terms of biologics. Germany, for example, has donated Euro 20 million to Senegal to produce, uh, to, produce a, uh, to actually come up with a new structure. And as I said earlier, South Africa has actually come, uh, well, has been chosen as uh, the site for a consortium for the local production of um, mRNA vaccine for COVID. So I am 22, minutes, 22 seconds before my time. I will stop there so that I don't take them from my hands. Thanks. Fantastic, thank you so much. I mean, I have to say, dear me, that's outstanding timekeeping. So thank you very much. Um, okay, we have about um, 10 minutes for questions. So it'd be great if either 
as we said before, please raise your hand or post questions in the chat. And um, I'm just gonna stop, there we are, great. Um, Jessie has got her hands raised. And I have to say as well, um, I'm just finishing off a paper on GlaxoSmithKline UK aid and UK aid in Kenya. So I have plenty of questions. So um, very exciting. Jessie, um, over to you. Thanks, Joe. Um, thank you so much, Jeff and Maureen. That was fascinating. Um, I'm, all, I'm also working, writing something at the moment about uh, the COVID, vac COVID vaccines and philanthropy, which is tangentially connected to this. Um, but one of the issues that I've been looking at is this um, whole controversy that's going on at the moment around uh, the a possible TRIPS waiver uh, to look into the question of intellectual property over vaccine and patents on vaccines. Um, so that they can be potentially um, reproduced in the global south. Um, and I wondered if, the, the, if this is something that's relevant um, it, around uh, cancer care and your analysis and also your more recent analysis of what's going on during the pandemic um, currently. I mean, what you presented here was fascinating because you really you were concentrating on the really positive aspects, I think, of, of the already existing capacity uh, in South Africa and other countries for the production of vaccines and other uh, pharmaceuticals. But I wonder to what extent this question around uh, patents and um, the transfer of knowledge uh, comes into this discussion and how much that's relevant. And Maureen, you wanna, you wanna take that on? Hang on. Yeah, why don't you start, Jeff? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether to switch on my controversial mind or... Yeah, go on, do it. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I, th I think the TRIPS issue is a huge injustice. Combining intellectual property and trade, which, 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 which had never been there in history, I think is a huge injustice. Uh, I would, I, I would, I, I would uh, latch on to Hajun Chang's uh, kicking away the ladder. People arrive and they kick away the ladder. And if we look at the history of pharmaceuticals, uh, German was way ahead in terms of the chemi chemical industry. And the UK did not accept IP until they had caught up. And most of the people who have caught up uh, in, in terms of uh, the ketchup, uh, late cameras and ketchup, they've always ignored patents. Now to then come in and not only enforce patents, but tie them to trend, I think is a huge injustice. So if you look at um, the HIV AIDS scenario, Countries like Zimbabwe, for example, actually ignored patents and declared the state of emergency and said, we will make these um, the ARVs. And by 2002, they were making ARVs and people who should have died did not die. But mm -hmm. that is actually said that there are some people that were buried that could not have died. So the issue of intellectual property is, I don't know. I think I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to Maureen. For me, it's just an injustice. It's, it's, it's a question of someone who's already arrived and making sure that they become very extractive from the capitalist perspective and literally stopping the others from catching up. Maureen, over to you. I, I, you know, I, agree, I agree with Jeff. I mean, the trips has always been a total anomaly I mean, in what the WTO is supposed to be, which is it's supposed to, I mean, ironically, it's supposed to be this free trade organization. And in fact, of course, it's establishing monopolies everywhere. Um, but, and I, so I agree, I agree with that perception. But the thing I think that is important is that also, is that most of the medication that people need in African contexts, 98%, 97% is off patent already. Um, and one of the things that started us off, you know, now nearly, I guess, 15 years ago, working on pharmaceutical manufacturing in Africa, was that, you know, there was an enormous push around access to medicines, but it had absolutely no effect at all on the bulk of people's access to the bulk of medicines, all of which were off patent. So there's a, patents are important, they're important in crucial moments. HIV was a classic. There's another one here around vaccines and, and monoclonal antibodies and all of that. But they're partly important as, as signals of power. 
And the, you know, the crucial ish set of issues, I guess, is that what you want is people to build up the capability to actually produce the bulk of what people need. And for that, you need a whole range of technology transfer issues, some of which are blocked by patents, but most of which are not. But it's nevertheless the case that it's the countries that have not been very interested in patents who or have actively ignored them that have also built up the industry in question. So the political economy of power and markets in this story is, is really pretty complicated. And I think it applies, I'll shut up in a second, but I mean, I think it applies to vaccine issues now, the politics of it, in that I think waiving vaccines is an enormously important signal and it will actually facilitate technology transfer. But the bulk of the challenge for African countries, which you know they're now focusing on much more carefully, is to build up what the Jeff's list, the infrastructure, the technological capabilities, and the mar and the procurement and market structure focus that will actually allow them to develop a competitive industry. And there's no reason why it can't happen, but up to now it hasn't, and it's one of the reasons why people die of you know, a huge range of interconnected um, infectious and non-transmissible and non illness. And, you know, something like a third of cancers in Africa are generated by infectious agents, much higher than in Europe, which is hardly a surprise given the importance of infectious agents and the intense problem of public health. So, yes, patents matter, but they matter in, in complex ways in the way that they're embedded in the power, system, power and market systems. Thank you. Um, we've got two more hands raised. I'm conscious we've got about two minutes left of this um, yeah. slot. So what I might ask is I might ask Helen and Louis to perhaps share their questions and for um, you, Maureen and Jeffrey to sort of note them and then we'll yeah. sort of make sure that we try and get time to come back yeah. to those at the end. So um, Helen first. Hi, thanks, um, Joanna. Um, thanks, um, Jeff and Maureen for your presentation. I was just wondering on the issue of technology transfer. So one of the targets in the sustainable development goals was to create a technology bank aimed at helping the technology transfer for the um, least developed countries. So I was just wondering whether you thought that might be a way to help some of the, obviously it's not going to cover all the countries in Africa, but some of the countries in Africa that, that are least developed, um, build up their manufacturing capacity for pharmaceuticals. Okay. Thank you. And Louis? No, I, I missed that completely. I don't know if it was me or whether oh, it was... Oh, did you? Oh, okay. Helen, I don't know if you want to repeat that question. Can you it hear me, Maureen? As well. I can hear you absolutely fine, but Helen, I absolutely couldn't hear. Maybe, Helen, could you just also write it in the chat? Yeah, I can no, put it in the chat if that helps. Okay, and then just to check that there's not an issue in our Zoom, Louis, could you just maybe say hello and it would be great to see if Maureen can hear you as well, actually. Hi, Maureen. Hi, Jeff. Can you hear me? <laughs> yep, okay. Okay. Can I go ahead, Joanna? Yeah, please do. Thank so, you, Louis. Two very brief questions. One, uh, when you show Jeff, you showed the, the labs within Africa. I'm just wondering if those labs, if I'm correct, I thought, are we talking about all public funded labs? What kind of labs are we talking about here? I'm just wondering how much of there's some private sector research and development of medicine in Africa. Just want to know a bit about that. And the second one, what is your view in terms of building a regional or continental, continental autonomy in terms of um, disease approach? I'm talking about the African CDC and our African Union trying to push for a more continental approach to public health issues. So this is my two questions. Thank you. 
Fantastic, thank you. And yes, we'll we'll come back to those later on, hopefully. But in the meantime, perhaps if you could type them into the chat, and then it means that if we get very little time to come back to this at the end, that Jeff and Maureen have still got them, and they might want to sort of carry on email conversation or something afterwards. Okay, so thank you ever so much. We're going to come to our second presentation now, and with we, this, we're going to be hearing from Aparna. So I know Aparna is with us. So perhaps if that can, if, if Aparna can just be spotlighted. Hello, thank you. And Aparna's presentation today is COVID-19, corporate social responsibility and the triple bottom line. So you have about 15 minutes. Um, I'll let you know when you've got three minutes left and then we'll have a few minutes of questions at the end. So thank you ever so much, Aparna, over to you. Thank you, thank you. Not yet, no. It's on its way. I yes, it is. Yes, you can just enlarge to. Yeah, is it full screen now? Perfect. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you ever so much. Yeah, thank you very much. So today my presentation is about the corporate social responsibility activities in India and the context of it is the COVID-19 pandemic and the triple bottom line. To start with, philanthropy in India has always been a topic which was there in the habit of the businesses in India, but not clearly called as corporate social responsibility. So it was there in the traditional practices of almost all the businesses in the country to contribute a part of their income towards the society, towards philanthropic activities throughout history. So when we see the flow of philanthropy in India, we come to see that in 2014, the government of India came out with a mandatory CSR law. And maybe India is the only country where CSR is a mandatory practice by companies which cross a particular threshold, like companies which have more than, let's say, five crores, and that's like half a billion in profit. They have to contribute towards philanthropy, which makes a lot of companies eligible for the activity. So this, the introduction of the CSR law in India actually brought about a lot of change in how CSR was viewed as an activity which is voluntary considered or voluntary undertaken by the businesses all over the world. And then in India suddenly it becomes a mandatory activity. So is CSR as voluntary as it used to be? So it became a very big discussion at a point of time. So uh, after the legal mandate in 2014, India came uh, throughout till 2020, in a very good manner in the area of uh, CSR activities and the funding for welfare projects. So CSR activities were actually aimed at increasing the uh, financial inflow towards social welfare projects. And so we find that in uh, 2020, by 2020 March, we had the pandemic getting hold of the country and the government actually named it as a national disaster in March 2020 last year. So in the, uh, when we look at the recent developments, India is actually in the midst of the second wave of the pandemic, but we, we can actually see that there are a lot of major shifts in the way the companies view CSR law and the way in which they adopt CSR activities and work with the social sector. So in the, uh, if, if you look at the, uh, if, if you look at the way in which the CSR law was implemented in India, we see that in the beginning, it used to be something like a public relation. Almost all the companies were actually focusing on how they could show up there uh, or maybe showcase their CSR activities as a way or maybe a secondary manner of marketing and getting their names established in the society. And then it moved towards a way in which they try to strengthen community relations. So in during the pandemic, that's what we see. There's a lot of collaborations between the companies and uh, the companies, NGOs or civil society organizations and the government itself, because now is a time when actually the different stakeholders have understood that it's the time to work together rather than working in pockets. So when we look at how the pandemic has moved through India, so one thing we can see is that when the pandemic started, the companies were actually, uh, the whole country went into lockdown. It was a sort of a very quick lockdown, almost all the country went into lockdown. We had a lot of news coming up like uh, the unskilled migrant labor who used to be settled in cities. They, there was a 
total exodus towards their rural villages. So that sort of, it was during the lockdown and none of the countries, uh, none of the companies could actually prepare themselves for this huge exodus which they met. So there were a lot of news regarding the hardships that the people had actually suffered during their travels. Uh, many people uh, unfortunately lost their lives because of the journey they had to undertake by foot because none of the options to travel were open, neither um, trains were not running, the railway stations were closed, then uh, the buses or other public systems of transport were not working. So it was a very hard time that India went across at the time. And we, unfortunately, we can also see that the companies were also lost to how to react to such a situation. There was nothing, even the companies, at, at some point we actually feel that where is CSR? We cannot CSR, we cannot see any CSR activity happening in India because all we see is like the people suffering, people unable to get access to the basic uh, uh, facilities in life, to, uh, to food, to shelter or clothing. So all of these activities came in India. So that, that was at the time when I started uh, wondering where these companies were. Because if you look at the history, we can always see that India, uh, in the, in the, even in not just history, if we just take the past five years since the introduction of the law, we can see that every year these companies used to like spend billions of rupees for uh, social activities, social welfare, developmental projects. And suddenly the pandemic hits and the companies are lost. They don't know how, what to do or how to do. So this was a situation which we had encountered at that point of time. So that's when uh, the government, um, maybe five, six months into the pandemic, there was a major shift in the law in the CSR law because earlier the CSR law did not look into uh, into tax benefits for the companies if they were undertaking any CSR activities and suddenly when we see uh, uh, after the pandemic for, uh, about five months into the pandemic the government came up with a small change in the CSR law where the government said that any company which undertakes any sort of activity CSR activity especially for COVID-19 so let it be relief activities or let it be contribution to research and development, they were eligible for getting tax benefits. So this sort of suddenly increased the way in which money flowed into the research and development sector in India. This change in the CSR law. So most of the companies and then the government also set up a fund for uh, funds by the prime minister, it's called the PM Cares Fund, which was set up by the prime minister. And then the, then the law said that any company which wanted, which did not know where to spend their funds for the COVID relief were also eligible for putting in their uh, CSR amounts to the uh, Prime Minister's CARES Fund. So then what we see uh, uh, during these five, six months into the pandemic and total national lockdown in India, one thing that we can see is that the companies slowly started realizing that the pandemic was not here to go away immediately. It was supposed to stay. So slowly, slowly, these companies came up with a lot of investments in the private sector, I mean, in, 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 the, in the rural sector and in the cities to actually increase the, uh, increase the fund flow into the society for, especially for COVID-19 relief activities. So these CSR activities, even now it includes engaging in the manufacturing and distribution of masks, of uh, masks, sanitizers, personal protective, uh, like the PP kits, providing meals to the downtrodden, making arrangements to the uh, arrangements for quarantine facilities. And then the government also introduced, uh, uh, actually the government also pumped in a lot of money to make makeshift COVID-19 hospitals. So the slowly, slowly, the businesses also came into the forefront and many of them contributed their facilities for quarantine. We have uh, the group like the Sacha group who owns the Saj group of hotels in India. They actually opened up all of their facilities for quarantining doctors because there was a time when doctors were unable to go home because of the uh, sort of uh, viral load that they were being, uh, they were facing every day. So at the point of time, many hotels came forward, many major hotels came forward and they gave up their facilities for quarantining to the doctors and nurses and any of the healthcare workers. So, this was a very welcome move because there was a time when they were these doctors were not even allowed to go home, especially when we were like getting accustomed to the COVID-19 pandemic. Then, then there was uh, then there was this. Uh, then suddenly we see that the businesses were getting more and more involved in the pandemic and ways to solve the pandemic. That suddenly we see a decrease in the amount of investment in the other sectors, like let's let's say ecology or environment or other sectors because. So for all the focus and all the effort towards COVID went into uh, helping the healthcare sector. So that's one thing that 
that that's a shift in the pattern because almost all the companies which used to sort of give away their csr funding into activities for the environment or for uh, helping old, old uh, like um, women child or people who are old so suddenly those type of funds had a very huge drop and almost most of these funding went into healthcare so that's one thing that we can see in this geographical spread of the funding during the pandemic so here it's a very uh, so this graph i can explain that this is how the csr activities were happening in healthcare and covid 19 related activities across the past in india across the past one, nine, 7 11 months 12 months let's say so here the darker uh, like these are the 29 states in india and uh, the more purple they are the more funding went into those states the least purple have got the least funding in terms of csr especially in terms of csr so here we see that the darkest of them is towards the western coast of india the state called as maharashtra and maharashtra that state maharashtra got the maximum funding in terms of covid 19 and it's also interesting to know that the darker of the states have the most amount a most number of companies acting there they are the most industrial states in india the most industrial states in india got the maximum funding so if you look at the western coast we have maharashtra where it's called as the financial capital of india almost all the industrial activities major most of the industrial activities in india happen in maharashtra so they got the maximum funding followed by let's say karnataka with 10 percent funding karnataka is also home to most of the it companies it's called as the silicon valley of india so obviously uh, most of the it companies have their presence there and they also contributed to us covid 19 activities in the state and then towards the eastern coast we have the state of odisha where we have nine percent funding there we have most of the uh, mining companies in india these are public sector companies in india mining sector is a public sector and uh, most of the mining companies and most of the heavy industrial companies have their presence in odisha so we see a nine percent funding in the state so uh, so so given that let's go to the least funded states like let's say down south you have kerala with just one person funding because Kerala doesn't have a lot of Kerala is usually a government run state rather than uh, an industrial state the Kerala has most of the their activities in the government sector and then because of that they got very less funding they have a few companies IT companies present here but then that this can be contributed towards their lower funding in CSR then towards the extreme east we have uh, north east we have Assam Assam also got very less funding because there is a lesser number of companies functioning inside Assam's border. So this was how the, the spread was actually happening inside India. So when we look at how the capabilities of the human, uh, the human capabilities were actually enabled during the pandemic, we see that towards, as I was saying earlier, towards the start of the pandemic, we did not have many companies coming forward in terms of CSR and helping the downtrodden in the country or the poor people uh, during the migrant exodus or any of the mishaps during the country. But towards the later period, like even now when we see the second wave, the companies are a major uh, major stakeholder in helping the government towards uplifting the situation of the poor or the unemployed and the unskilled labor in the country. So they have now started giving a lot of provision like food or uh, shelter towards these people who suddenly find themselves on the road because of Aparna, um, three three minutes. Aparna, yes, three minutes. Yes, yes. So, so now we see that because of the pandemic, education sector is one sector which saw the maximum change coming in. So, we also see that businesses from uh, the, uh, the other major part of businesses which is not contributing towards COVID nineteen relief efforts have started giving in um, IT infrastructure to the students who are almost throughout the year they have been going to school online. So they have started helping kids in getting accustomed to online facilities to those people who are unable to afford it. They have been providing um, tuition sort of classes for them, especially from the rural areas where people are not able to get a good connectivity, internet connectivity and things like that. These companies have come up and they have actually given a lot of funding to those people. So the businesses at the moment through CSR, so they have been trying to reducing the disruptions of decent living by even enabling better facilities for their own employees and the contract labor who are usually coming from the unskilled part, especially in the rural mind sector. So in conclusion, we can see that what we need during the pandemic is a collaboration between the government, businesses, as well as the society. None of the stakeholder can function during such a time individually. And so they all have to collaborate and bring about certain changes in the society because businesses might not be able to sort of affect the people in the bottom 
bottom of the pyramid. So at the bottom of the pyramid, the bad NGOs and the CSOs have a better presence. So the businesses are actually collaborating with them. And then it's important that we have to shift the focuses. The businesses have to now think about shifting focuses to problems like ecological sustainability, which has been having a very, not a very great sort of impact last year. And then we have to sort of, and now actually I can think that we can't say that they have to start, they have to continue with their society strategic CSR model then going with a company strategic one, which used to be the case when they had started the CSR in CSR activities in 2014. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Another um, fascinating presentation. I think the only trouble with this session is that sort of 20 minutes for each presentation is not going to be enough. But um, we have a few minutes now for, for questions. Um, Francisca, to begin with. Uh, thank you. And thank you so much for a really interesting presentation, Aparna. Um, it's just so, so interesting and definitely within uh, the work I'm doing as well. I guess I wanted to I guess I wanted to challenge uh, a little bit. So two things. The first is obviously CSR has received a lot of criticism over the last two years. As does it really provide? Is it really a way to um, provide that sort of business sustainability um, help to mitigate some of that impact on communities and giving back? You know, is it is it still a thing that it, that that works and it's all just a tick box for companies? And I guess the second one would be um, about whether I thought, I thought it was really interesting when you talked about how um, about the, the like the opportunities for supporting vulnerable workers, and it'll be great to hear a bit more how if you think businesses are by supporting other maybe vulnerable workers are thinking meaningfully about also the workers they employ themselves, you know, within their supply chains. I think they're interesting, and there's just so many things honestly that I love to ask. But uh, these two things for now will be interesting. Thank you. Yeah. So. So CSR in India is not without any loopholes, but then we have to also agree to the fact that India is an emerging country and mostly one of the greatest problems that we face every day is that the government is unable to take care of every need of the people. So it's like a huge, it's not a very huge country, but most of the times one of the problems that the governments actually face in India is that they're unable to reach the bottom of the pyramid. So these are places where the NGOs and CSOs, civil society organizations have a very good presence. So these NGOs usually have types with the businesses. That's where the CSR law helps them in procuring funds. So earlier, this, that was not the case. The CSOs and the uh, NGOs used to have a lot of difficulty in procuring funds because usually these funds were supposed to come from government laws and policies. And these funds usually get tied up in the in the process, you know, the government will suddenly say that, okay, we're going to give you this much of money. But by the time the, that money comes into the ground, that like comes into the hands of that NGO or CSO who have asked the fund, usually there's nothing left. It might be corruption or it might be because of the red tapeism, we don't know. But usually that was a major problem. Now, even now it's being studied in, in a lot of detail. We have government policies which have a lot of money tied up in them, maybe as long as 40 years the money never reaches the bottom line. So in that case, in that sort of a scenario, something like CSR is helpful. It's not helpful, it's it's not, I'm, I'll never say that, even I have actually written a paper, I, I've actually critiqued the fact that CSR in India is a minuscule project of whatever the government is funding. Over the five years, if you take over from 2014 to 2021, if we to calculate the total amount of money that is flown through CSR, that's absolutely peanuts compared to what the government would be spending on a particular sector one sector. So that's the amount of money which flows. But then the change is visible because those rural areas which did not have access to any sort of funds now have a small hope because even it, it, it might not be a very significant change because I, I personally have seen a lot of rural areas where they did not have access to tap water. So they got help from these businesses through the, the, that CSR funding actually helped them get water, get these facilities, and then they could actually increase the crops. So these sort of small changes are coming in, not without faults, but then still, yes. Where the government cannot reach, maybe the businesses can reach, that sort of thing. Then about the vulnerable workers in India. So uh, the problem of migrant labor actually achieved international uh, attention because a lot of people were suddenly on the roads. They did not have any, any sort of way to go home. The span is quite great because people there are people who travel more than 1,500 kilometers to reach home. 
they travel for like on foot they travel for more than 10 days to reach from their place of work to their homes so that sort of a thing happened it's mainly because india has this problem of a law having a lot of illiteracy obviously illiteracy leads to the creation of unskilled labor forces and these labor forces usually come from those states where development is less i would say because you know education plays an important role if they, if they are not educated at the point of time they have to support their families and so they start moving towards the cities the urban areas and then suddenly a pandemic strikes they are on the road they just don't know what to do so these situations are there in india i wouldn't say no but then if we look at what happened after that great migrant exodus now we see that these people have returned back to the cities but now there's one more thing in the second wave that we see that the government also had learned its lessons so in the first wave the government was also clueless of how to act so they suddenly brought out this lockdown and everybody was on the road without food without shelter or without any sort of uh, any money and things like that and then during the second wave we see that the public transport system is not at a standstill so it matters the public transport system actually matters so it's not zero it's not like last year when the trains were not running the buses were not running this time we see that even though the situation in in a few cities in india this time was very bad in a few cities uh, we had a we had a very high death rate etc people were actually craving for oxygen and things like that did happen in the major cities the industrial cities but still the situation was not like last year we did not see any migrant labor issues the companies came forward and then they started taking care of their migrant labor their labor forces etc so changes are there maybe it's not like 100% but then what we saw during the first wave we have a totally different situation during the second wave it it's bad still but the situation is, has changed in that way yeah i i hope i answered your question thank you so interesting honestly it's um you just you i just um i think you make some some really fantastic points um but i'll leave other people to ask questions uh thank you francisca anyone else questions for aparna and obviously, um, thank you, Francisca. Great question. Is CSR a tick box exercise? Um, yeah, we could have a long conversation about that between the, the people involved in, in presenting and being a part of this panel today. But any other questions for a partner at this stage before we move on? Okay, I think we'll pause there. Thank you ever so much, Abhana. Again, yeah, fantastic presentation, very interesting. So we'll come to the final presentation in this first part of our session today. Um, and and it, we're gonna come back to Francisca now. Um, so Francisca's presentation is towards new models of accountability, addressing modern slavery in global supply chains during the COVID-19 pandemic. So have um, 15 minutes, Francisca, and I'll let you know if you like, if you need it, if there's a, when you've got about three minutes left. So thank you ever so much, over to you. Thank you for the great presentation um, and, uh, and to everyone. It's just such an honor to be sharing this work with you. Um, and uh, unfortunately my colleague Ellie wouldn't, wasn't able to join me. Uh, hopefully I do justice to the presentation. That we put together so just for a bit of context i've worked for work free over the last year if you don't can you hear me well francisca yes sorry just, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry go on lewis just george he needs to go and it would be great to be with you because he, he has the meeting at 3 30 i thought he was going you're going to allow him to speak now and francisca, we can stop we can stop no worries it's uh, the same for me sorry about this because no worries no worries yeah. it's the same for me actually it's so okay joanna Sorry, do you need to go as well, Francisca, at 3.30? No, I don't need to go. No, I'm... I'm okay, not. yes, there we are then, yes. Yeah. So over to Louis and, and George. Yes, you have, yeah, 10 minutes. Sorry, yes, I know we were kind of, we kind of kept our spare minutes towards the end. So knowing that things probably run over, but so, yes, uh, please. It will be George presenting because he was doing the, all these interviews that he would like to share with you. So okay. George, Thanks a lot. if you want to come on yep. board. Thanks a lot, and I'll share my screen. Can you guys see it? Yes, yes. Okay. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And as uh, Luis uh, 
said, we just wanted to share with you some preliminary work we have done around big business and COVID. I think similar to this presentation, we also wanted to look at uh, the actions that certain um, African companies were taking at the COVID uh, time. Um, as you may know, actually, Africa is home to a fairly large amount of what we call corporate giants, that is companies that have more than 1 billion in revenue. Um, and they are present in a wide range of sectors from technology, retail, media, financial services, et cetera. And I think it's really interesting to see the dynamism and transformation of these, of these companies. Um, and, and I think that despite the fact that they are extremely relevant in Africa, they are actually fairly understudied, both from an economic and from a development perspective. And I think there isn't a lot of work done in general to see how they act, what they do, and, and how that differs from, let's say, the more established Western multinationals. Um, you know, at a time, and I think you mentioned this in your introduction, right, where many Western governments and owners left left Africa, and we we thought it was interesting to see what actions some of the local players were, were taken in the market. We are uh, at a fairly preliminary stage. We have interviewed executives from seven, seven large African businesses, and we will continue to do so over the coming months. And we just wanted to share a perspective on some of our findings. These are the companies that we interview and, and they represent, uh, let's say a good mix of sectors, geographies, and all of them are fairly uh, large uh, organizations on the continent. And then here is a preliminary list of other companies that we also want to interview to incorporate in this uh, study. Um, I'd say the first message that we want to pass is that, you know, the response to COVID-19 was fairly rapid. Um, one of the comments that we really like is, you know, they mentioned, if anything, we know how to handle or how to manage risk in Africa, which is very interesting. When you look at how companies reacted in Western countries, they were everything but that quick. Um, and so from this perspective, it was really uh, interesting. Um, it, was, it was actually insightful to find out that a lot of companies indeed had a protocol to deal with a virus outbreak, uh, particularly those in West Africa that had to face Ebola um, in the past. They were ready to, to act, and so they had uh, a written protocol in many instances. And, and in general, you see that a lot of them quickly got to work with the government donating PPE the public, equipment to healthcare clinics, to governmental institutions. Um, and you see that some companies in particular uh, took a fairly active and prominent role. So for instance, here we would like to highlight the work of the Dangote group uh, that even before the first case in Nigeria came in, they implemented an incident action plan with the Nigerian Center for Disease Control. And they actually provided uh, the company sorry, the government uh, and the public with a lot of equipment. So for example, ambulances to the airport and they leveraged some thermal uh, cameras that were provided to the four main international airports in the country. So thanks to Dangote, uh, Nigeria actually had some of the most advanced uh, virus identification capabilities in the world um, just when the, when the crisis started, right? So, so things that you know, just a big business decided to do uh, for the sake of the of the country and probably of their own um, business. If we highlight some of the actions that we had uh, identified in the course of our of our interviews, I mean, obviously one of the first things that they did was protect the workers or, or, and customers. Um, they did a lot of work donating PPE and essential goods to the to the public. Um, interestingly, a lot of them were actually really active in terms of raising awareness. As you know, um, people in a lot of African countries do not trust their government too much, uh, but they do trust their companies. So the role that some of these organizations play in raising awareness and passing on certain messages was really important, right? So, you know, we, we heard that if, if the government asked you to put on a mask, you, you did not do it. If an influencer that was paid for by a corporation did that, um, you paid more attention to that. So that was, so that was really um, interesting as well. And then we saw that in most instances, a lot of the basic equipment that got into these countries came from um, companies as well, right? It is the case of uh, Shabrik Group in South Africa or Sassol. Um, I would also mention um, in, in general the, the whole notion of 
shifting or leveraging resources that were used for other things. So in general, what, what was really impressive is that a lot of the marketing budget of these organizations quickly were shifted to manage the, the, the COVID crisis. So that was at least for us something in terms of the impact it had, um, very um, interesting. Um, also a lot of work that, that was done was around mitigating the economic impact. So we used so as, as was the case uh, in, in India, we just seen that uh, a lot of work around trying to mitigate the impact that this had. So you had issues like um, pre-data plans you had issues around facilitating um, communication. Um, you had a lot of donations of meals. Um, also, interestingly, interestingly, they also uh, try to facilitate solidarity within the country. So there were a lot of digital solutions that we found interesting that were meant to help Africans help other Africans. So for instance, um, we saw cases of virtual vouchers where Africans could share money to others. We saw uh, way fees um, on money transfers and mobile transactions, right? So, you know, in a, in a fairly um, cashless society in many respects, this was, this was really interesting as well, a way to get that money in particular to rural areas. Um, and, and also we would highlight that they lended a lot of financial, a lot of infrastructural, a lot of technical and a lot of managerial support uh, to their governments. Um, so, for instance, in some cases, particularly in the mining sector, they made hospitals available uh, for the exclusive use of COVID patients. Um, you had uh, big multinationals that came together to donate money at scale, and they put forward some coalitions. And these coalitions were pretty holistic because not only they provided funds, uh, but they also provided equipment like ventilators. And they also provided technical assistance. So they brought in expertise from abroad uh, that could advise uh, some of the governments. And this was paid for uh, by these uh, multinationals, right? So these are kind of a summary of some of the things that we had um, identified. What was, what was very interesting for us is that there were really two distinct phases in these um, work. Uh, one was roughly from March to August, uh, where companies did not really wait for the government to act. Uh, the governments were overwhelmed. A lot of the donors were not there. Um, there wasn't really a lot of um, help coming. And so they stepped in. But the minute that the governments, the African Union and other international organizations started getting involved, actually a lot of these organizations decided to withdraw. Um, in some cases, it was because they felt that they were no longer needed. So somebody else would, was doing the work. But in other cases, and I think this was a comment we heard multiple times, um, they were concerned about the mismanagement of resources. So they argue, you know, if, if we're going to be providing the money, we're going to be providing assistance, and what we're going to meet on the other side is is the endless corruption that that we typically see. Don't count on us. So this was really interesting hearing this perspective. You know how they were willing to step in um, just until the government got got involved, right? So you know we thought this was. This was a, a, an interesting um, insight to, to share. And, and the fundamental question that we have is if, if there's going to be a lasting impact post COVID, right? Um, I think probably there's likely to be a new relationship model. Um, a couple of minutes, a couple yeah. of minutes just to wrap up just, there. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, just finishing here. And so, you know, probably we wonder if there's going to be a new relationship model um, if, if, you know, Western countries decide to. Um, perhaps to start donating or, or getting less involved in, in African issues. Um, we wonder whether corporates will need to replace some of these efforts. Um, we see in general that there is an increasing concern to comply with ESG standards. Um, and, and a lot of companies that actually go to public markets for funding, um, they, they probably need to build a different way of doing business and, 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 and getting more, more involved with society is a step in the right direction. Uh, we have seen a lot of these companies have faced severe supply chain disruptions. And this is something we saw in Europe as well and, and, and was the case there. Uh, and so if that is the case, and if this is a lasting impact, uh, and if these companies and economies need to reduce the reliance on foreign imports and promote intersectional link linkages, we think that the impact that these companies ha can have in the continent um, would be massive. Um, and probably, you know, we would say that this digitalization drive has actually helped um, a lot of these companies as well and, and, and has created 
uh, multiple opportunities and, and probably uh, to some extent try to um, democratize certain services that they that they provided, right? Um, and and you know probably as a last remark is we don't know whether the new normal will be different, whether there will be a framework where companies can do uh, what they have been doing during the crisis, but uh, at scale and with impact. And this is it. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Um, another amazing presentation and dear me what yeah how interesting we have we have you for a couple of minutes left with us George so um any questions I can see um Francisca you have your hand raised Francisca if someone else have, has a question please uh go no you you were in first so off you go well I thank you so much for the really interesting presentation I was actually really surprised of, um when you presented the two different phases and how first companies stepped in but then once the government got involved they you know they they acted so differently i guess my question having done some research myself on inclusive innovation how we can get all companies um in the private sector with government international organizations sitting at the same table um how do you think do you think that's a possibility for this uh for this giants african giants uh because i i guess you would need a more holistic approach if you're going to have any sort of uh, real sustainability or la lasting, meaningful impact, social impact, right? They need to be working together. And how do you think that's possible? And how how could you how do you think that could happen? Mm -hmm. I I actually think it's possible. I actually think that a lot of well, thanks a lot for your question. But I think it's possible. I think a lot of companies uh, want to get involved. I mean, at the end of the day, they they they're made up of individuals who are concerned about the development of their own economy. So I think, you know, they fundamentally want to, to help. I think probably the system doesn't work for them um, in a sense, right? Um, and, and, you know, because also there are a lot of concerns always when these organizations get involved with the government, they're probably a bit hesitant to engage in those discussions. So, so we think that if there is a, a right framework, if you have, for instance, the right fiscal incentives, um, if you actually stop treating them as the enemy and start treating them as an actor that can help, I think a lot of these things will 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 make a difference, right? The issue, and, and this is what you see, and it's a bit uh, unfortunate, is that there isn't a lot of engagement between the government and these very large corporations. And in general, the development industry, quote unquote, doesn't really care about them. You know, doesn't really see them as... I guess, relevant actors, right? So everyone is very concerned about SMEs um, and micro companies and, and they should be, but but sometimes we forget that that you get more impact if you start focusing on, on the top of the pyramid. Um, so I, I hope it happens and, and I think there's hunger for that, but you just need a different way of doing business. Thank you, that's a- Thank you. It's good to see, no, there's hope, uh, there is, there's some hope. <laughs> yeah, at least I'm to, I see there's someone else with the ones to ask a question. I will stop now. George, do you have time for um, Maureen? Yes, I have questions? time for another Maureen? question. Yeah. Okay, go on. Go ahead, Maureen. This is quick. I was wondering about Chinese firms and the subcontinent and in Sub Saharan Africa, and in particular, whether you'd tried talking to Huawei and what they said, what their general approach is. So, um, we um we approached a chinese firm a very large chinese firm and they were not very forthcoming um i i think they i would say that in general they're not very keen on sharing um what they have done and and um yeah i, I don't think you will be hearing a lot from from them but we approached them and, and we had a conversation with one of them um, but we didn't go very far with it, unfortunately. It would be great, I mean, if we can connect with them and try to understand what they do, but uh, yeah, they, yeah. Are, they don't share that much. They may also, I'll, I'll stop now, but they may also have a less of a kind of style of how to respond to this kind of questions. Yeah, yes. I think, I think they, um, they, 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 they play a really interesting role but um, it's not always that transparent. Yeah. 
Thank you. And would you have time for one more question or do you need to go now? I need to go in a minute, but yes, if it's brief. Okay. Aparna and then um, George, well, yeah. I'll leave it with you for sort of, obviously, if you're still here in five minutes time, then I'll um, I'll say stop now, but um, over to you. No, 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 I'll, one minute, I've got to run. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would take a lot of time. I just, uh, I just wanted to tell you something because uh, I felt uh, that this was like, it was like an elevation. You know, you, we both of us were talking about two different parts of the world and how they, how the companies, the businesses in those places looked at the pandemic. So uh, for me, also, it was a great learning listening to you, just to know that there are countries which can actually foresee what's coming up, not like what happened here or maybe the majority of the world. What I was talking about. So uh, I felt interesting that if you could just uh, sort of expand it study towards uh, transnationalism like looking at how these same companies performed at other countries where they're present it might actually lead to a lot of insight hmm. yeah it, it, it's interesting but multinational but, corporations yeah. from other yeah it, it's interesting and 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 i got around but i'll answer to that briefly it's interesting but a lot of these multinationals had uh, a local strategy in each country right so their actions were not necessarily focusing on exclusively on their home countries. And when you look at what they implemented, they actually did so across a number of countries. So you could see the MTNs, the EcoBanks, the Dango Test, they implemented a similar strategy across a wide range of markets. So, so I guess they, 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 they had that perspective. And now I'm really sorry, got to run. Thanks a lot for inviting me and congrats on the work you've thank done. You, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, guys. And thanks, Luis, for, for his work on this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, George. Um, sorry, you have to run, but thank you ever so much. And um, yes, I'm going to come back to Francisca now. Gosh, our time is flying. Um, but um, Aparna was just asking there about, obviously, sharing contacts. Um, I know that when we've sent out emails to everybody, that everyone's email is in there anyway. But I think if you're definitely interested in sort of continuing some of these conversations, or you're happy for people to contact you, then please just post your email in the chat. And then Jesse and I will just sort of field a, a, an email to everybody just to kind of facilitate that. So Francisca, thank you ever so much. Um, over to you again. Thank you for the presentation again. And uh, just so honestly, so delighted to be here amongst everyone and we'll definitely be engaging with, uh, uh, with people through um, if you leave your, con your email address. So, um, all right, apologies for, I'm gonna be bringing you some slides again. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see that very clearly. Thank can you. Can you hear me well as well? Sorry, I always think, I always wonder. Um, I can hear you very clearly, yeah. Amazing, all right. Um, well, so I did this research um, with my colleague, Ellie Williams, who's, like I said, not able to join us today. And this is, um, reflects part of the, the work I've been doing over the last year with Walk Free uh, as a research analyst. So they are Austra an Australian organization who, whose uh, aim is to end modern slavery within one generation. They produce the Global Slavery Index. And as part of that work, we're looking at government responses to modern slavery and to different forms of modern slavery, forced labor, human trafficking. But we end across uh, risk, legislation, prevention, uh, but also we've now been looking at businesses as well, business responses. And I think that's what I bring you today. Our pre presentation is called Towards New Models of Accountability, Addressing Modern Slavery in Global Supply Chains. And I should also say that I'm currently, now a, I'm now a PhD student at Royal Hallway, University of London. Uh, my research is also within the remit of the UNESCO Chair of ICT4D and the UKRI South South Migration and Equality and Development Hub on my deck hub. And I'll leave the links in the chat. Oops, I forgot to put my... Could you please let me know once I've once I only have um, a few minutes left? I will do. Don't worry. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. So well, I guess this research. What's the really the focus of this research is really understanding how um, not just business in general, but fashion brands how they're responding to modern slavery and supply chains during COVID nineteen, and particularly highlighting the role of civil society and pushing for more corporate accountability. And we will get to define that in a second. But why is what is modern slavery and you know, and, and why, is, why is it so prevalent in global supply chains? Um, modern slavery refers to, it's an umbrella term that refers to the most serious forms of exploitation. Uh, if we try to imagine exploitation within a continuum, we can, we can see that uh, minor 
forms of exploitation can then progress into more serious forms of exploitation, for example, uh, and paid overtime, contracts not in a worker's language, withholding of documents, uh, can then progress into more serious forms of abuse and exploitation uh, that can turn into forced labor indicators um, and end up in a and leaving a worker trapped in a very, very difficult, vulnerable situation. Uh, some of the worst forms of export or modern slavery are, amongst the forms of modern slavery, we have also early enforced marriage, which is not within the scope of this, of this work. Um, we have human trafficking. Um, and uh, we also have sexual exploitation, other forms of sexual exploitation and debt bondage, which is very much linked to global supply chains and to forced labor. Unfortunately, so within the what 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 work free has produced as a global estimates of this um, this heinous crime, we have estimated that just within the global supply chains of private corporations, there are uh, an estimate of 16 million victims. Um, and like I said, the most form common forms will be debt bondage when victims, when migrant workers, for example, have to keep paying a fee that is significant, because a significant portion or most the majority of their own uh, salaries at destination um, or, or under threat, forced labor where they have, where they have their, where they can be, the movement can be restricted, their uh, documents can be withheld, which means they cannot leave, they're not being paid. And also human trafficking, which uh, includes the, which is the, um, the, the moving element of the exploitation. Uh, we also know about modern slavery is that it is a gender problem. At Walk Free, we launched a report last year called Women and girls, and actually, I realized um, that although it is Walk Free 2018, we have launched a specific report just on how women and, gold, and girls, women and girls supply chains are most, most vulnerable to this because they work in an informal economy or because they work in industries where labor protections are very slim, for, as for example, the garment industry. And so, 71% of all victims of this crime are women and girls. Going back to the business, understanding a little bit why the business, why what is the role of business here, we have seen that over the last few years, uh, we have started to talk about the, why businesses need to protect, prevent, and remedy human rights violations in the supply chains. And this 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 started because some of these major failures. I know Werner Plaza, the building collapse, um, was probably one of the most significant ones that people remember. It, Werner Plaza building had uh, around thirty. Um, it, it sourced for 30 international apparel brands, and so it was very significant. And because of the number of of, um, of people that died and got injured, it, 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 it received um, international attention. And from that resulted then the, the Bangladesh Accord, which I'll speak in a second. But there's been all the incidents as well, very significant. And in a report by the Clean Clothes Campaign, they've mapped all of these. Uh, they have an, uh, um, a major fire in a factory of Ally Enterprise in Pakistan in 2012, Rana Plaza, a um, major reports, some reports of some hazardous working conditions in Hansa Vietnam Co Limited in 2015, a boiler explosion which killed people in a multifab factory in Bangladesh 2017, and then 2018, the, I would say the more, the, the major forced labor reports in top gloves factories, which have carried out to today, and it resulted in early this year, and, Last year, Top Glove playing the biggest settlement to workers ever in the history of a private company. What all of these ones have in common, all of these incidents, is that they had been audited. These companies had been audited, they were certified, these factories, uh, they were within regulation, and the, all the companies who sourced from these factories um, were very well known brands. So I think this takes us to the point, which is, so who takes responsibility when something like this happens? Because the first thing that most of these companies do when an incident happens is cut, canceling a contract and withdrawing from the region. There's plenty of research saying that when a, when a, uh, when a major corporation, let's say, for example, payroll brand like Zara, um, not Zara maybe not a great example, but let's say ASOS, for example, withdraws from a, from a region and cuts a relationship with the supplier, all the workers, thousands of millions of workers who worked for those factories are going to be left with no wages, unemployed, and further vulnerability. Um, and then this also means that the brand will have some bargaining power to uh, negotiate lower prices with other suppliers as well in the region um, because of that incident as a, a way guarantee. So the way I want to discuss particularly this, the, how we define accountability to see how so far it has been problematic and how we should 
frame it moving forward because of what we've seen in the pandemic. Um, so the way Grant and Kion define accountability is through th three elements. First, you have to have a standard. Um, these standards are a set of standards that are meant to hold actors accountable, whether they're not to whether or not they have fulfilled responsibilities aligned with these standards or not. And then the second is imposing sanctions if the has been determined that these responsibilities have not been met. And the third thing is information is critical so we can collect evidence to enable this holding accountable power uh, to justify any actions that, are, actions that are imposed, sanctions that are imposed, apologies. So far, the standards are set by governments, international organizations. Um, sanctions are, uh, are applied by regulatory bodies, for example, certification that happens through um, that is uh, happens through auditing, and then information usually is provided by companies. How 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 many of us can say that companies are fully transparent and telling us exactly what's happening in the supply chains? Even a lot of them either know it or they have no visibility into anything beyond uh, tier one of their supply chain. So this is what I think is problematic: is that standards are very much inconsistent. Different modern slavery and due diligence le legislations have very different standards and obligations for companies, which means there is lots of um, margin for companies to uh, walk out and uh, and to just and, and play around these le regulation uh, legislations. Second, sanctions are pretty much in, in existence and ineffective. My legislation like the UK Modern Slavery Act, which was a claim for actually trying to hold countries companies accountable for modern slavery risks in their supply chains, doesn't have any penalties for companies who do not fulfill the, the legal requirements under Section 54, which is transparency supply chains. And the government doesn't even have a list of which companies should be reporting. So this is extremely problematic. Um, and the third one is companies are not, are not very keen on disclosing information. So what we have is very much limited and unacceptable. So often uh, trade unions not being able to survey what's happening in factories makes it very difficult to ground truth what the company is saying, even if it's very limited, with what's happening on the factory floor. Um, some, I think everyone here would be familiar with some of these international frameworks that I think I'm, not that I'm critical of, they are great as a framework, but they don't really impose, they, they are guiding, uh, they're more like a guidance, they don't have um, an actual compliance that comes with it. So the UN Protect, Respect and Remedy Framework or the RUGI Framework, uh, um, for example, is very, uh, extremely relevant. But there's also, um, there's also some criticism of it to say that it's not just enough to say that companies need to respect human rights or avoid harm. They have to actively contribute to ensure these rights are respected, um, particularly because they profit from uh, having these workers uh, working, having these workers in their supply chains and working, producing at very competitive levels and selling. So they would be the most, they should be the, the most interested ones in having greater value in their supply chain amongst all stakeholders, not just the shareholders. The Accord for Fire and Building 70 in Bangladesh was one of the, was uh, one, I think one of the most significant type of standards that was uh, imposed and especially in the aftermath of the Rana Plaza, um, the Rana Plaza building collapse. But, and you know, it encompassed over 160 brands, 1,600 factories and over 2 million workers. And while this was alone not enough, it provided some sort of accountability for companies. But we also know that this, independent legally binding agreement has expired this of, as of 30 May this year. And there's no, there's no plans yet to replace it with a new one as there's still not negotiations ongoing. So right now in the most vulnerable, one of the most vulnerable times for, for workers in the garment industry in countries like Bangladesh, there is no, this, there's even less protections available. Some of the national level um, framework that we already mentioned, we have the supply chain due diligence like California Transparency Supply Chains Act, UK Modern Savory, Australia Modern Savory. And here we have a map of some of this progress ongoing, specifically in Europe. Of But we can also see that although there is some adopted law, which is the green, uh, countries in green, like Norway, Germany or France, the in, in blue is the civil society. And this is what I want to bring you, bring you a bit, um, uh, bring you today is Besides the role of civil society fulfilling the shoes for the big corporations. We, we, I don't need to tell you. Three, three minutes, just to let you know, Francisca, three minutes. Amazing, thank you. I don't need to explain much more how the pandemic has really exacerbated these vulnerabilities for supply chain workers. And one of the worst things has been just the unpaid wages 
shutting down orders, which workers were, had already worked on, which means they went back to their families with no money, being let go from factories, and, and which would trap them in, leave them vulnerable to much further exportation and increasingly situations of modern slavery. Um, from the corporation's end, it was a great year over the, uh, the pandemic has been very profitable. Um, and so we see mechanisms of accountability are not working, legislations need strengthening, brands are getting away, and the accord has expired. In this study, we tried to look from, compare what companies were telling us, what they were disclosing, and what civil society was collecting, data they were collecting. And we selected top, uh, 40 top fashion brands. This is what the companies told us. So we went to look, uh, I, I, we analyzed the modern survey statements of, four, of top 40 fashion brands. And this is what they told us. They told us that they have almost 80% have supplier policies to cover some sort of modern slavery risks. They have, they do risk assessments, 80% almost of them do risk assessments. But then we also see only one in every five companies has some sort of worker remediation. And I can tell the most common form of remediation for these companies, what's canceling the contract right away. So it just tells you that, although there's high risk assessment and, and policies in, in theory, the, the commitment doesn't translate into much action. And many of them were reticent or were not very forward about disclosing any incidents that they had identified over this time. What civil society has been done has done is with through public outcry and campaigning and working with through trade unions and often situations of workers being locked up in factories to finish orders they were not going to pay getting paid for or were getting paid much less. They started this big campaign around pay up for big corporations to step in and pay what they owed basically. And so this is what we found from the civil society data. We, we've actually, there was quite a lot of positive action uh, towards supply chain, um, supplies and workers from companies during the, so this is specific data uh, from collected by civil society on uh, what companies have told us. We've actually seen that no company, for example, has agreed on any policy on price reduction. They've demanded full price or more. They've tried often to get away uh, with even paying less. We see that only half companies have endorsed ILO's call to action. And, I'll, and but we see the most shocking is that although profits for 70%, they have, they have disclosed they went up, they have fallen behind on positive action for many other indicators like monitoring wage, wage and severance payment or uh, having a policy, a pandemic policy against discriminatory dismissals, for example, or even so only 35% did not pay for in production completed you orders. If you to just start wrapping up now, that would be great. Thank you, on, almost, almost there. So you see, there's a big gap between what the companies were saying, I think, and what, they, what they're actually doing. Um, and so we, here we have a, a bigger, we, have a, we can see some of the brands actually. So we have Primark, actually, surprisingly, I don't even buy from Primark because I don't, Engage with try not to engage with fast fashion, but Primark has been the one of the companies doing the most positive action uh, throughout the pandemic, and they were not even the the, uh, the companies that had better disclosure. So when we compare both, we can actually see that this is according to the company data. This is what the good they're doing versus what civil society is telling us. There's actually some intersection between them, but there's still a lot of companies like Burberry, for example, who say they're doing great. And then in reality, they're really failing workers. And this is a, a, a brand with a massive market gap, right? They, they are very, um, they, 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 they have increased their profits massively during the pandemic. Um, so just to finish, and this is my last, my last slides, is just one of the frameworks I found to try to explain uh, this civil society fulfilling to step in the role of businesses is being through surrogate accountability by Rupstein. And so he says that when there's no, there's such an inequality between power wielders, uh, which is in this case corporations and accountability holders, which should be the workers and trade unions, um, you need to try to think of accountability, another model for accountability. And this would be maybe a, a different model, like a surrogate who will step in to help an accountability holder to uh, hold power, power holders, power wielders accountable uh, for any abuses, for what's their responsibility, and it's not just setting the standards, but also collecting evidence and sanctioning. And in the sanctioning, that is us, the consumer. Consumers went up to social media, participated in a pay campaign, and said, "I'm not, I'm boycotting these brands because you're not paying your workers." We've seen on TikTok and all over social media how this happened. So we have become, in a way, we have become part of that of this accountability model, where we can help sanction 
companies and civil society can fulfill the rest. And so this is how we would complete the, the model according to Boris in the pandemic, which is standards are also set by advocacy organizations that collect information and, info, uh, and provide recommendations to inform policy and ground truthing, which is so important. We as consumers help provide their sanction because reputation matters more than ever, much more. Now, and the information has to come from the workers who are obviously have the lived experience and, um, and civil society to help amplify and boost the experiences. Thank you. Sorry for the you, delay. Jessie. I think I got a bit lost in the beginning. It was, uh, sorry. I'm gonna hand over to Jesse now, thank you. Thanks, Joe. thank you, Francisca. That was really fascinating. Um, such great data that you've got there. Um, I, I'm afraid we're really running behind time. There's just so much interesting uh, work to discuss. Um, I think we maybe just take one question now for Francisca. Uh, and then if we've got time at the end, we can take a few more. If anyone's got anything they'd like to ask Francisca now. No hands going up. <laughs> um, Okay, maybe in that case, uh, we, we'll move straight on to Joanna, uh, who's our last paper and is just gonna speak very briefly. <laughs> uh, and then we can come back to questions. If there's anything for Francisco or for any of the other papers um, at the end, then we'll take them then. Thank you, go ahead, Jo. Thank you. And um, this is probably the wrong way around, I'm guessing, in terms of what you can probably see my presenter slides, yeah, I'm guessing. Yeah, we can see our uh, next slide. Okay, bear with me. Well, I'll just swap them very quickly. Hold on. This always happens to me and I'm never quite sure how to um, stop that. Move that there. Try one more time. I'm going to try this and if it doesn't work, then I will just leave it as it is. How is that now? I think it's the same. That's great. As yes, no, that's, okay. that's perfect. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. So let me just put a timer on. I'm going to be four minutes. Um, okay, thank you ever so much. And yeah, thank you everyone for being part of our panel today. I'm just going to introduce you briefly to a paper that I'm involved in writing with my colleague Simon McGrath here at the University of Nottingham and a colleague Primo in Primo Adoye in Uganda. And we're asking the question, what next for international oil companies and multi-actor skills development partnerships? And the first thing that we've done to think about this question is to look back at international oil companies. Um, I would use the overarching term corporate social responsibility and sort of framing that into three phases, beginning with exploitation sort of in the 80s and early 1990s, moving then to what you could call or what we've termed reactive CSR, um, which has all the various kind of reams of CSR that you could call whitewashing, you could call um, just sort of tick box exercises, pr pr proceeding to things that are more strategic, particularly then involving sort of multi-actor development interventions. So plotting those three phases, but looking at those as well across the trends in vocational education training and policy around skills development at the same time. And what we see by looking at those three phases is that some of these sort of multi-actor skills development initiatives have actually become quite polarized, partly because obviously IOC, IOCs have become more strategic in working with different partners, particularly NGOs, for example, whilst at the same time policy on vocational education was quite far down the agenda because there was a lot more focus on getting children into primary education. So sort of this work around skills, skills development almost becomes, sits quite separate to any other sort of initiatives. Um, critical issues reflect some of the things that we've seen already, issues of accountability, state capacity in vocational and skill systems and external pressures, for example. 
Um, the case then we've looked very specifically at skills interventions in Hoima in Uganda, where because they found oil, you have this huge nexus of governments, international donors, international oil companies working together to try and promote skills development locally because it wouldn't happen naturally without those interventions. People aren't, you know, local people in a small town in Uganda are not going to be getting jobs in the oil industry because you're talking about high skilled, predominantly expatriate level jobs. So you get a lot of interventions to try and sort of bridge that gap. So points that we're beginning to see is that in terms of IOC unsettling around these whole ideas of skills development programs and partnerships, circumnavigation of state structures and institutions, institutions designed to try and support vocational education training, the challenge of short term needs of international oil companies, particularly around skills and the long term requirements of sort of vocational education and skills development strategies. You can in you see very high demands for sort of sector specific skills development, but that pretty much only targets small numbers of the population versus some of the challenges that are there around sort of providing sort of mass skills development opportunities, particularly when you start to look at the numbers around sort of global issues around youth unemployment implications for IOCs and multi actor skills development initiatives. I would argue that you can see some progress in these types of partnerships, but their structure and their purpose needs reviewing for various reasons, some of which we've seen today. Um, drivers of these programs are things like licensed operate, CSR expectations, but they don't necessarily lead to the best options for local communities. And I was very interested in the conversation that we've been having around um, I think um, Aparna first raised it, this idea of sort of a society strategic CSR as opposed to sort of company led CSR, but there's plenty of problems for that. So what next? Scope for more innovation, be interesting to look at the role of international oil companies and skills development, particularly around green technologies. This idea of regional anchor institutions, we saw that in one of the other presentations and building on sort of local capacity. And that was a team that was a picture there. I'll end on that. That's a picture there, sort of like the local, the local team there in Uganda who, who were sort of involved in the, this case. And that is me over sort of five minutes, but I think that's all right. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Joanna. Amazing speed presentation there. Um, so many apologies, everyone, that we've run over. Everything was just too interesting. Um, we've we've got three minutes until four when we're officially supposed to close. Um, so I, I'm actually going to use those three minutes just to give you some very brief um, information and announcements about the Business and Development Study Group. After that, Henin, uh, are we allowed to stay in the room if you're able to do that and don't have other comments? Yeah, I'm yeah, not absolutely. sure if we're allowed to do that. Okay, yeah, fantastic. So maybe, I mean, I project again, I know that we've gone over time, but if anybody would like to stay after four, I can certainly stay on and maybe we can uh, address some of the extra questions that have come up. Um, so I will take two minutes just to quickly uh, um, tell you a little bit more about the Business and Development Study Group. Um, we are, uh, sorry, first of all, if anybody is not already on our mailing list, we've got a really great mailing list, about 150 people on, on there. Uh, if anybody would like to be on that list who isn't already to hear about future events that we're organizing and to share resources, please post your email uh, in the chat box or to me personally in the chat box or email me directly and I'll make sure that we put you on the list. Uh, also, as Joanna said earlier, um, sorry, my kids just got back from school. It's a bit noisy. Um, also, as Joanna said earlier, we are actively now looking for new conveners for the group because we're in a transition period between conveners. So if anyone's interested in that, please also do let Joanna or myself know. Um, finally, two very quick plugs. Um, we've got a, a special issue coming out in the journal Development in, pra Development in Practice later on this year 
co-edited by myself, Joanna and Jason Hart at the University of Bath, who is a previous um, convener of the study group. Uh, and that's on the private sector and the development landscape, partnerships, power and possibility. Uh, and it's based on presentations that have come out of um, the the group over the course of several DSA conferences and other events that we've organized. So please look out for that later on this year. And finally, um, Bristol University Press has also just very recently launched a new book series uh, called Business, Finance and International Development that myself and Farwa Sial, who is also a convener of the group, are on the editorial board. Um, I'll post information about that also in the chat box in a minute, but if anybody has got a manuscript looking for a home, we would very much, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, so one minute to four. <laughs> uh, anyone who is able to stay on, please do. I can see we've got a question here from Jeff that I will take first. And then I'm, and then uh, I'll also scroll back in the text box because I know we've got a few earlier ones um, that popped up during some of the presentations. Um, and if anyone else would like to to get into the queue for questions, also please raise hand or pop your question into the chat box. So, uh, Jeff, please you go ahead first. Thanks, Jessica. This 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 um, and John, thanks for a very fascinating presentation. So, my question is. Yeah, actually, I need to, because I'm actually convening. Sorry, Sorry go on. Jeff. Okay, so 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 I, I, it's two issues that I want to raise. One is more of a suggestion. You're looking at international oil companies and how they interact with the local community. I know a colleague at the University of Edinburgh Business School. They're looking at the notion of Africa capitalism. Uh, it's, it's basically um, um, trying to conceptualize what is the the position of a capitalistic entity in relation to the local community that is embedded in. So I don't know much about it, but I know that's, that's one of the things that they're, they're looking at. Then the other, the other issue is um, maybe drawing on, in my, in my previous previous life, I, I, I used to look, I used to be a banker and looked after the oil, oil, oil companies. So companies like BP, Caltex, Snowship, Sarko, Mobile, um, and, and, and a host of others. Your study is looking at the interaction with the external community. But what we found as a banker was in terms of training people who joined the organization, they were really good. So it would really be interesting for you to, to look at that, to look at the training and skills upgrading that they have for people who join the organization and what, uh, the impact. Well, what, 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 what? How, how does that compare with the external in terms of the society? Thanks. Yes, thank you. We, I didn't get a chance to sort of, you know, chat through that. But one of the things that we've seen in sort of mapping the three phases that is that you do see that the oil companies have become very, very sort of proficient in training their own staff, but also then in working with governments to actually sort of train up you know, their internal workforce. And Tullo in Uganda is a classic example of a company that really sort of kind of almost swapped an expatriate workforce for a local Ugandan workforce. Now, at the end of that, they actually pulled out of Uganda. Right. So that's where you kind of see that whole sort of long-term trajectory of sort of, you know, financial investment needs in that sense. But um, yes, thank you. I'll e and I'll email you about your colleague. I'll, um, I'll get in touch if you don't mind. Thank you. Thanks, Joanna and Jeff. Um, Luis, you had a question earlier, I think, for, for Jeff and Maureen uh, around the funding of labs, pharmaceutical labs in Africa. Would you like to unmute yourself and pose that question now? Oh, I also, I wrote it also on the... Sure, would you, shall I just read it yeah, out? Yeah, I repeat, I just repeat. Okay. So first one was in terms of the labs, basically research and development, who are we talking about when we talk uh, about funding? Is it public, private, philanthropy, multilateral, bilateral aid? How, what are we talking about here when we talk about labs in Africa? Second one is uh, your view on this attempt by African Union to build an autonomous continental public health policy by building, starting with this African CDC. So what is... Uh, basically your view about this. That's it. Jeff, why didn't, Jeff, why didn't you go first? 
Okay, many thanks, Maureen. And uh, thanks, thanks, Louis, for, for bringing that up. Um, I will start with the one on, on the labs on uh, who funds that. And I think it's important to separate uh, the different types of pharmaceutical entities. So you have the vaccine manufacturers and you have the small molecules. By small molecules, we're talking of those who produce pills and everything else. By and large, the, the small molecules are privately owned and they don't do research and development. They started the formulation development and work backwards to local manufacture. Um, so they tend to, to fund that using their retained earnings. Those who have a decent business case are able to go to the banks and they get funded. But usually the development phase is very rare for them to be funded. Mostly they are funded working capital for you know day-to-day -day, uh, day -day operations. Now, now, when you come to the vaccine, uh, vaccine uh, side, that's where the ownership is kind of different. So if you go to South Africa, in fact, you only have five countries that do vaccine manufacture, South Africa, Senegal, Tunisia, Egypt, and um, so I'm, I'm, I've forgotten the fifth one. Anyway, so only five. So if you look at South Africa, for example, it is a public-private partnership, which is BioVac. If you look at Tunisia, it's Institute Pasteur de Tunis and Senegal, Institute Pasteur de Dakar. And uh, Egypt, it's, um, it's um, uh, Vaxera. So, so the, 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 um, the portfolio of funding, I think, depends on which unit you're dealing with. So if you look at a unit like BioVac, for example, bring, uh, I know there are projects that have been funded using donor funds. And then there are other projects that they have funded using, for example, they've outsourced certain, certain technologies and they use that money to fund that. Jeff, what's the, pro what's the question is specifically about laboratories? Uh, Louise, what, what it, did you say labs or were you? Uh, laboratories, yes. I was, because I was mentioning one of the slides that Jeff showed. So I was trying just to understand yeah, but... what about that, yeah. Yeah, so, so, uh, so uh, 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 my assumption was when you said labs, I just assumed you're talking of pharmaceuticals and that unit within the pharmaceutical company that does that. Or maybe that was the wrong assumption. I mean, there, no, are, no. there are some independent WHO pre-qualified laboratories, which yeah. are used by the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. So what I was just trying to understand is when you talk about research and development within the laboratory system, what are we talking about in terms of funding? I just want to understand how is the system uh, when we talk about in the African, I would assume there would be well, I don't know, depending on the fragility of the states, there will not much money for research and development. So you would have either philanthropic money, you had like multilateral aid. So I'm just try trying to understand that. Yeah, I think there, I think it's a mixture of government laboratories because and um, some externally funded, but also there's some private, there's some private commercial labs. I mean, I think, it, I think it varies. Jeff, I, I'm not sure, but I think it varies a lot by country. Yeah, it varies. So, I, I, so uh, forgive me, Louis. So, for me, when you say laboratory, it, it means something totally different. So, are you looking at analytical laboratories, or are you looking at uh, that develop research and development function within a firm that that, that works at being a drug to market, or in terms of a research and development institute? Exactly that Not one. Memory, Mostly, is. it's like the basic. A lot of the basic research, I would say that. For example, let's do Kenya, which I know much better. Yeah. You know, they run a huge number of clinical trials. They have laboratory. Um, and it's a mixture of externally funded private um, money and government Kemery, for example, laboratory. Yeah. So it's a mixture. Yeah. Um, driven, driven quite a lot, I think, by the by the clinical trial system. So, so if 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 pathology shortage. Yeah. The reason, so maybe just to, I was trying to, I was yeah. asking, I'm asking you just basically trying to understand to what extent there is a potential to move into the next level, which is, so if you start doing some more local research, some basic research, then maybe there is, there is a step forward. You might also think really about manufacturing, local. producing locally. So I'm just wondering, instead of- quite a lot of basic science. I mean, like, you know, South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria, for a start, all have world-class science. 
um that's not a you know it's not something that they need to start on they have a huge amount of this already yeah. um i think it 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 is enormously different country yeah. by country but they do already you know there are there is already a scientific base in quite a few yeah and, and it, it actually depends by country so maybe a way that i could rephrase it is if you're looking at the innovation infrastructure from research and development or research translation and commercialization south africa would be a very good example so south africa if you're a researcher depending on the number of papers that you produce and the number of phds that you supervise it is linked to the amount of money that you get for government to fund your research and so the more you publish the more you supervise phd students the more you get this grant annually for you to be able to do something. And over and above that, if you then do bring uh, something that needs to be tested, try out, you then have the CSIR in South Africa, which can then look at scaling up those things. And eventually you can then work, I think they call the DTI, Department for Technology and Industry, looking at commercialization. So it depends on which country you are looking at. So we did a piece of work that looked at that and you find that the, the, the picture is different depending on on the different country and exactly what Maureen is saying some of the basic research in quite a number of the countries it's um it's money that's coming from outside i mean a, a good example is kemri welcome trust which is heavily welcome funded it's in it's based in nairobi and outside nairobi yeah. um has a lot of clinical trials expertise and a lot of other science yeah. has a good a strong scientific base yeah. there are a number of examples of that in a, in a, a number of african countries However, however, when it comes to the pharmaceutical firms, what is fascinating is usually the universities are not the universities are not working with the with the private sector. No, so no, there is a big gap with the universities. So yeah, so most of their research or formulation development work is actually being done in house. Yeah. The of other big the, gap is is pathology labs. Yeah. And the you know there's a chronic shortage of pathology for the health systems. Um, which obviously relates to whether you can do public health and therefore whether you, you know, what you, what, what you're generating. So, and as Jeff said, there's a big gap between, with the university. But and, it, and the second question, Louise, I'm going to be a politician. Yeah, the CDC, go on. Yeah, I'm not going to answer it direct. <laughs> go on. I'm, I'm going to answer it by, by using a concept that uh, my colleague Maureen and, and another colleague, Julius, I'm not sure that he's, he's not in now, how they developed. Uh, which is the notion of local health. Um, the long and short of it is global health, international health is outsiders looking in. And it has all these links to colonialism. And I mean, so for example, international health um, is, is, is all about trade. So we don't want you to bring disease from where you've gone, uh, gone to. Global health is about, you know, these infectious diseases, let's give you money to solve them where you are so that you don't bring them to us. And so these are outsiders looking in and there is no one who's looking from the bottom up, asking the clinician, asking the local scientist, asking the local epidemiologist saying, what are the problems that you have locally? And how can you work on these problems so that you can solve them using your own ideas and your own intervention? So they, my colleagues, Maureen and Judas call that the local health uh, approach. So I, I, I am I, I am inclined to 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 adopt that because it's it's locally contextualized. It looks at what's going on on the ground and responds to that. Um, the issue of coming in at regional level and and I may have misunderstood your question, but the issue of establishing things at regional level, I think, may be a perpetuation of again trying to solve things not at the level that they they require. However, I still think it is important maybe at regional level to have things like CDC because they become a, a coalition point either for technology transfer or learnings and linkages and everything else. I think I, think I feel po much more positive than that about the African CDC. You know, I, I, I think it's a hugely important moment that um, John and Guy Song has really established a voice for African public health on the international stage, which has simply never been there. Um, and for all the strengths and weaknesses, and you know, it's a struggling institution and so on, it's an important moment at the African CDC. 
it's it's changed the narrative i think in a number of ways so um it's providing a platform that wasn't there before so i'm i feel extremely positive about cbt i think it's i think it's important however the challenge will become how do you translate what's done at supranational to national level i know i know but i yeah. it's yeah <laughs> Yeah, and, and I guess nice to that, CDC. I think it's important. <laughs> yeah, I guess it takes me to the question that uh, what who was it who asked? I think it was uh, Helen. Helen had a, had a question yeah, about you. technology transfer. Is Helen still here? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maureen, you wanna you wanna go first on technology oh, I transfer? Don't know anything about the technology bank? You do that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so I Helen, one of the things that I've really found so yeah. I, I like the idea of your technology bank, mm. but uh, when you go in and you talk to these. Uh, these innovators, they tell you that tech transfer is, is really complex. It's, it's about establishing relationships, it's about culture, it's about learning how the other person works. And if you notice, we have said that most of the people who are doing the innovating, they're the private sector. And uh, this is something, if you then look at the tech, so th that issue of establishing relationships and knowing how to do things. So one, one of the examples that I got was, I think it took them almost 10 years to do a tech transfer for one, te for one technology. And after they learned certain things from there, they then realized the second time around it took them three to five years. So, so if, if you bring this technology hub, I think it's important that these aspects of, of, of these relationships and setting up these relationships and understanding each other and culture and ways of doing things is taken into account. Is it a good thing to have a technology bank most certainly, it is. What but is I think the, the, the devil is in these details of bringing in these people to work yeah. together in a way that actually allows things to work. In Absolutely. Space. And I guess one of the things, Jeff, that you and I have been mm -hmm. seeing is that when you get a real shift in technology transfer, it tends to be associated with new partnerships yeah. um, and new foreign investment. So... Um, you know, some of the shifts you're seeing in Kenya at the moment is to do with an Indian, big Indian multinationals buying out Kenya, yeah. Kenyan firms or buying into Kenyan firms um, or buying into Ugandan firms, whatever, so that the, the, tech, not, the tech transfer is then in-house, yeah. whereas before it wasn't, um, which can help with these issues about culture so that a couple of firms that were previously family firms have said that they've sold out or sold partially out to get their hands on technology um so it's it's it, it, i think it's there's an issue of what technology is available but there's also the issue of how you, i think which you're saying jeff and i can and i've learned from you really which is the, the main issue is being able to use it and to do that you may just need to be part of an institution that already knows how to use it so you need for foreign investment, basically, of some form. Yeah, and I'm not sure if it's Helen who, who put a message earlier on who was saying they were working on the tech transfer in the food processing industry. Yeah, it was someone else. No, I think it was someone else. Um, yeah, that was, a, I think that was... I think it might have been Radha. Oh, okay. um, I think she had left the chat, yeah. Because, uh, because what, we have got her email here if you're interested in getting in touch with her, yeah. Jeff. Yeah, please yeah. share the emails. Exactly. Yeah. Because one of the things that we, um, um, uh, we are also finding out in this project is that uh, in as much as people really run at MNCs, the MNCs have been really great at technology transfer in-house. And what has tended to happen is they do in-house technology transfer. And because of rationalization of production systems, they may then say, okay, we don't want to produce anymore in country X. What then they do is they sell off the facility in country X and allow locals to buy that facility. And so that's one of the ways that what used to be an MMC becomes a local firm, but you also have movement of people from these MNCs to local firms. And that becomes a form of, of, of tech transfer. Uh, and this can only happen the, in- The MNCs are- not necessarily European or American. We're talking yeah. big Indian MNCs, big yeah. Chinese multinationals, exactly. um, not necessarily by any means European or American. Yeah. So. And what, what, what I've also found from experience 
uh, at least in the banking sector, was that the transnational or multinational banks had really good training programs. So whenever the local banks then pushed this stuff, they actually went out, went on with uh, control. They carried with them some of these new learnings that they had and changed systems. Mm. I think we've answered all the questions, haven't we? I think so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff and Maureen. Um, does anyone have any other questions, Jeff and Maureen, or, or for any of the other presenters? Before we wrap up, I feel we could go on for hours. <laughs> no. Okay, well, maybe, oh, Jeff, do you want to have? Yes, I think it was Francisca. Thing, I? Yeah, I think it was Francisca who presented on um, uh, on uh, modern day slavery or um, yes. stuff like that. And, and, and I wanted to ask her um, in her research, at what level do you bring in culture into this? I grew up uh, in Zimbabwe. Um, when we were young, after school, we'd go and help our parents in, in, the, in the petty urban areas. It was a way of teaching us to be responsible citizens. And so at, 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 at what level do you, so if you go to, to Ghana, for example, in the, when they're producing cocoa, or if you go to all these other countries, at what level do we distinguish the culture and training, training children to become responsible and the issue of, let's say, for example, child labor. Thank you so much. That is, I'm just sorry. I'm just not that I'm laughing. It's just a great question, and I got the same question in DSA um, the last time I was I was at DSA, and the person presenting was presenting on. He was trying to say why child labor definitions, international ones, are wrong and don't account for cultural relativism, and he actually brought us chocolate from a farm in Ghana where he was from. So it was, and it was very moving. And up until this day, I think that's something that carries with me always. So it's just, sorry, it's just so interesting you asked that. Um, I think, for example, with child labor is very separate, I would say, from other forms, for example, if it's amongst um, adults, people's age, the problem with, the big issue with how you define modern slavery very clearly is when someone does not have the agency to leave a very vulnerable situation. Because even something I've always defended in my work and very much in line with the capabilities approach is you should be able to exercise your own agency, even if that counters your own well being, right? That's what Amarsha Sen explains, right? And people will stay in situations that are actually detrimental to their own well being and health. And, but that's okay because you are exercising your power. Uh, your agency. Now, the problem with uh, this exploitative situations, let's say a, 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 work, a migrant worker um, in the garment industry that is uh, been, who, who, um, who is in a very vulnerable situation where, for example, they don't have the contract, the work contract in their language, where they don't have, where, they, where the factory management keeps their documents so they're unable to leave, uh, where their payments are withheld, where they are paid less than they were promised. They are just, they certainly you see here series of indicators that say these people are in the presence of a vulnerable situation. But the question is, do they know they are in a vulnerable situation? Many of them don't know because as a migrant worker, your information, even with all the technology we have today, might be very limited and you're more willing to accept something that is actually in truth not acceptable and acceptable because maybe it's not in line with uh, labor regulations of that country. So for example, when I came to the UK over five years ago, I did what I think a lot of Portuguese do in London, which is I did cleaning jobs. I, uh, I worked in um, housekeeping and I didn't know I was getting paid at a minimum wage. And I had a fake contract that was not in my language and I didn't speak English very well. And so the lack of awareness, because you don't know what's acceptable, you cannot stand up for yourself and you cannot leave the situation. You just normalize it. And I think that agency is a key concept here. So with adults, it's easy that you can say, we just need to help amplify or enhance an adult's agency to leave, to choose to leave or not of all the situation. Just a, just a side note, the, one of the projects I did in uh, South Asia that we, an, a mobile app we tested in 16 countries was about helping a worker understand through a questionnaire that they were in a vulnerable situation or not. And then we tell them, this is your situation. Do you want help leaving or not? And they can choose to stay, but you're giving someone a choice with a child. It's a bit different. It is already a level of complexity because a child legally does not have the ability to consent 
in that in the same way, right? So that's that was very difficult. But I do understand, and sorry for maybe going a bit um, going a, a, a bit further on this. But with children, and we've seen with child labor, we try to treat it very differently because children, because of children's, um, because of because of this 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 idea of that children not being able to legally consent, um, it's a. Uh, so, uh, international standards, they're very Western centric, might consider that in some countries you have very high instances of child labor, which actually not true. For example, one of the countries with the highest number of ch uh, child with the highest one of the highest child labor rates is Lesotho. And I had a colleague from Lesotho who said, I grew up helping my parents with a cattle after school every day. And it's not like a job. It's just what you have to do because you help your parents business. And he has always been very much against a lot of these international labor standards because they think they unfairly put company, put countries in uh, labels. They're actually not addressing real issues. The issue is not keeping children from helping parents with cattle. Maybe is making sure there's free education, education infrastructure so children can then move on to other things, right? Um, that is the, 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 big, the big issue. And I think there just needs to be a, a very generous dose of cultural relativism looking at these things, uh, particularly because in some economies, uh, children, for example, a child in Ghana that helps to work in a cocoa farm, if that's the only way for a child to afford studies, maybe my view from a Western country is that that should not be allowed in a sense, just a hypothesis, but that's the only way for that child to pay for education, which is very expensive. Right, so which is expensive and to pay for their own food and, and support the family. So if that's the only way, that is the only way, right? So that's a, it, it's, a, it's a very, very tricky situation. But in general, when we talk about mom slavery, I try to keep child labor slightly separate. Um, the only one I would include is uh, forced and early marriage because girls, especially with the pandemic, we've seen so many girls who because of the pandemic and parents losing um, uh, you know, uh, business, Girls are being married off to help provide for to improve the family's financial situation, and this is not fair that a girl, a young girl, has their life completely uh, jeopardized because they're marrying off a man four times their age from a different community, and they'll never see their family and friends again. And these girls are, you know, under fourteen year old, or fourteen years old. So that's that's another form of mom slavery that I think that for, uh, affects minors that is completely separate from the child labor. I think claims. I don't know if that um, that helps to provide some context, but it is a massive debate in the field, honestly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's 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 interesting because I I I I am being the devil's advocate, and I'm looking at the issue of decoloniality and uh, how sometimes certain lenses are imposed on a certain people. And if you look at, um, so it's easy when you're looking at a situation where you have an, a, a, someone getting into a contract with an employer, but if you're looking at a cooperative situation where a farmer with his household has to produce these things that he sells to someone and the child has to help. I, I, I think there's, there's, there's need for contextualizing issues. And also sometimes I worry about lenses that are developed in the West that are applied without due regard to, 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 to local cultures. It's, it's, that's, that's just my worry. I'm, I'm, I'm not condoning anything that, that is deleterious on, on, on children, but I think it is important that cultures are respected and people understand the ways of working of certain cultures. Anyway, let me shut up here. I will say this, I think that is can I say that is spot on. There's like a massive debate. And if, for example, even I've been criticizing in my one of your previous works, even the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's completely uh, it doesn't have universal ratification acceptance because it is very Western centric. It's a Western centric view of what human rights should be, you know. And so it is normal that there's only one. United Nations protocol with universal ratification, actually it's a child labor one, which is, and that's the whole conversation how how that campaigning happened. Uh, it's a numbers mm -hmm. game, but you know, it's it's it says a lot. It says how a lot of the inclusivity and uh, diversity within uh, this national international regulations and frameworks actually need to be pretty much decolonized. And the, you know, and the ideas need to be challenged. And I think this idea of cultural relativism is so important. But also, for example, we can, there's lots of great areas, but there's also cases where you can see, you can say, for example, for a migrant who goes to, a, a, I've interviewed migrants in, for example, in Thailand in 2019, who um, were not aware that working 14 hours a day was not, was a bit beyond acceptable. 
uh, and they didn't know they were getting paid half the price of Thai people, of Thai nationals. And this is an, an acceptable standard that it's a clear black and white case in a sense, right? That you can say, this is just not, this is a line where they, you know, this is not relativism, this is straight on exploitation. In those cases, we can intervene. Um, but it has Francisca, to have- I'm, Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry, because th this is such an important debate um, and I, we could carry on, but I'm afraid I think we really do have to close now because actually Joanna, I, two other people in the room also actually have another meeting in 50 seconds. So I'm really sorry, sorry. but I think I will have to close it, but I'm really sorry because it, this it is so interesting and so, so important. And I think, um, uh, yeah, the, these are really important issues. There's never enough time to discuss everything that comes up in these panels. So I'm very sorry to, to put an end to that, to that conversation. Um, but yes, everyone's email is here and we can circulate. We'll, we'll save the chat box, chat box and circulate the emails as well. And hopefully we'll have an opportunity to continue this discussion in the future. Um, thank you so much to everybody and for everyone to st for staying over uh, at the end here. This has been a really great panel. I've come away with lots to think about. I'm sure everybody has. Uh, and I very much hope that we can continue the conversation in other forums in the future. So thank you very much to all of you and hope to see you soon. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jesse. Bye-bye.